Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about X-Men 97. So this is an animated show that continues the 95 animated show from the X-Men, which I loved. And right off the bat, the voices are somewhat familiar. I didn't do a super deep dive, but I think they got some of the voices back. But uh, to make a a quick, you know, preview of this, I've been a fan of X-Men comic books. Uh, I'm born in 71. I've said this a lot. I, um, I've been a dungeon master, game master, I've role played. I even have a huge collection of comics. The X-Men has always been special to me. And as the 95 show ended, I was caught up in it. I wasn't a kid, but it was just, um, Something I always eagerly watched, and I'll admit, uh, Batman, probably even a better show, technically, and Spider-Man, they had some really good shows on, even when Superman was on and they went to the Justice League, so I'm a huge fan. The animation from the old to the new is a nostalgia kick. I can tell it could be done better, but... It just does bring you back, and it lets you get immersed right into the show. It takes place a year after. So the X-Men 97 show, I enjoyed thoroughly. But it's not without some crit critique and things that... Um, one time I almost wanted to fast forward a bit, which was really surprising to me, that impulse. But I guess... Today's day and age with streaming, maybe it's just becoming a you know, part of the zeitgeist type thing. And I was started to think about the episodes themselves as I was getting ready to do this. And I guess besides my love and my nerding out on just having the X-Men back on TV, being an animated show that ties to a huge part of my past. I mean, me and my friends watched it religiously. Um, as we did most of the other shows that I mentioned, uh, there was a Japanese animated X-Men that looked incredible, but didn't have a real story that compelled me. They did a Wolverine version also, but here we are with X-Men 97, and as much as I uh, enjoyed it, I really felt that they rushed a lot of stuff. Now, if, you, if you're a fan of the comics and you kept... I stopped collecting comics uh, around 2008, 2011, as I petered off and just stopped by 2012. Totally, I think. And then I have been catching up, or I have caught up over periods of time with online comics and some of the shows that I really like on YouTube, like Comic Pop and things like that. So I have an idea... Uh, somewhat informed about how the X-Men have been going in the comics since the show ended. And I gotta say, I'm surprised that they rushed so much stuff in the show. I'll briefly go through the episodes, but it feels like way too much and a little uneven pace as you're trying to... But there's a great episode with um, Storm and Forge. You can feel the show breathing a little, getting into um, a comfortable place for me to try to start getting together what's going on, who are the characters. I mean, every episode is jam-packed, and that could be a good thing. It's just, you know, something I noticed that was, you know, not sitting right with me. So, as I said, um, the voice actors are excellent. The... Uh, you know, to, to name all the voice acting would be silly, but um, it's created by Bo DeMaio, obviously Marvel Comics. There's 10 episodes for the first season, and I'm almost positive they're going to get another season. It seems too popular. And with a show that can draw from everything they've done, and maybe made a decision to closely follow what was done in 95, the show, all the little storylines and where would they lead. It does lead to changes that I found um, refreshing, in a sense, where things are not exactly the same. 
But another part of my critique is some of the things that are way too the same. So, like, real quickly, I'll go through the episodes. Um, number one is, to me, my X-Men. And it's a year after uh, the assassination attempt on Xavier. Who they keep saying is dead, and he has a death certificate. But it's revealed, and you kind of know he's with the Shi'ar, with his love. Um, and they were, like, they were the only ones who could heal him. It was that type of thing. And it's a real... A cluster of people as you start realizing who the X-Men are now and where they're, uh, you know, where they sit in the world without Professor X and how are we going to keep going. And they have to save a young mutant, uh, Roberta DaCosta, who eventually becomes Sunspot, which is I thought was an odd choice, but maybe for... Maybe for the visuals, you know, his sunspot, his body turns black with bubbles, and he's a fire-based solar mutant. It kind of blended in and adds a little more flair to the show, rather than I would have just thought Sam Guthrie, you know, um, Cannonball. But anyway, Jubilee's there, so you can you got the, the X Men on call, saving the um, uh, sunspot of Roberta da Costa, and. It's right away you're thrown into Sentinels. And it was um, just weird that it all happened again so fast. And, you know, again, I, I know the fanboy in me is loving the show. And I was smiling from beginning to end. Like I said, only one time did I have a reflex to go, all right, you know, enough of this, like, this portion of it. But okay, so you got the first episode, you're finding out where they are, how they relate to each other in the world without Xavier, um, who's on the X-Men, um, save a new mutant, uh, literally a new mutant from the com- you know, new mutant comic, and Master Mold, and fucking Sentinels, and it's just, it's, it's great. Um, you know, they give Cyclops a really good entrance, and a really good method of using his abilities and fighting, uh, melee, and physical. So I was happy about that. Seeing everybody get together, the team, and we go into um, Magneto. And oh, so Jean Grey's pregnant. You find out, and it's just so. Again, first episode, lots going on. Who are the X Men? Where are they now? New mutant. Got to save them. Xavier's uh, presumed dead. Cyclops leadership, the whole thing. Jean's pregnant, find a new mutant, master mold, sentinels, and Magneto shows up with the last will and testament of Xavier. Now, it was a book. Well, I guess paperwork. And I'm like, if this thing's not uh, going hand-to-hand with a video, like a video diary or something, how the fuck are you going to trust it to begin with? But, let's assume it's Right? And spoilers. Oh, there's a spoiler coming up right now. It's real. Fucking Xavier gives the fucking school to whatever. And it gets into it because there's a lot of drama in this show. Added into all the action, all the craziness. Um, and Magneto is revealed to be the new leader. Uh, kind of giving Scott and Gene a way to raise their kid like to get away. And it's revealed, spoiler, spoiler alert, that that was Xavier's intent. I found it to be contrived and just bullshit. But okay, Magneto's in charge. He's going to save people. Um, You know, Gene and Cyclops are deciding to stay. Rogue, Gambit, the whole shit. There's a little bit of fucking things going on with uh, the, the government, Valerie Cooper. So they come to arrest Magneto. And he agrees eventually to you know stay in trial for his fucking actions but again this is happening in like rapid pace um friends of humanity there's like groups that we know them from the 95 show but i was surprised at how fast it was just picking up and just going forward during this battle uh executioner shows up which i thought was a 
cutest Easter egg nod, but he was actually fucking dangerous in the sense that he had a weapon that was going to depower Magneto, but Ro, um, Storm jumped in front, gets hit, loses her abilities. Um, and again, it's a huge thing, public um, trial, an attack, X-Men defending, you know, the whole drama of why Magneto did it, what's, what's his future going to be, does he really follow Xavier's dream, Jean gives birth to a baby, and name it Nathan. Um, my fucking Nito goes bizarre, captures Executioner, brings everybody like to the very edges of the atmosphere. And he's like, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna kill you, I'll let you live. It just, it just felt weird. And again, I'm thinking, oh, okay, if this is one of those, you know, he's doing something slick, doing one of his machinations, okay, I sort of buy it, but if it's revealed this and so was actually true and they're going to do it a different way, my brain started putting connections to things. And there's a, you know, Magneto gets pardoned because he fucking saves everybody from the, and he quells the thing, but it, it's not too fucking... Um, clear he just stops everything in my impressions of it, but it's X-Men Mayhem, Friends of Humanity, Super Weapons, and that's how they found out in the first one, the first episode, that they were using weapons, and then they found a hand of a uh, sentinel that almost killed everybody, and in the second episode, Magneto's in charge, he proves himself, I'm doing the quotes in the air, and um, they're discussing everything, um, you know, Storm gets told her powers are permanently gone, and Jean arrives, but Jean's already there. What? So, yeah, Jean arrives, help me, She's her memory's all fucked up, but the Jean that's there, obviously, and I believed it. Just believes everything's no normal in the sense that she's the real Jean Grey. But Beast does a fucking test. Does episode 3 now. Fire made flesh. Beast is doing a test. <clears throat> he finds out that the, B, the, the Jean Grey lion, um, you know, sort of fucked up memories and needed help. Is the real Jean Grey. And the one that they've been doing adventures with is a clone. And during the episodes, as they reveal things, it's not really clear when she was switched. And I think they do one of those. It doesn't matter at that point. I'll get to that, I guess, in a way. So Sinister, Mr. Sinister, contacts the other Jean. Uh, this is when she starts turning into the Goblin Queen. Um, giving the baby Nathan to Sinister. They want to protect the baby, so it's fucking mayhem. Um, and Morph is actually important in a way, because he was the whole first, uh, the first series, he was a pretty much a, um, victim of Sinister and thought dead. It was a pretty cool reveal when he came back. Um, so there's a lot of shit going on in the fucking mansion. Again, all the X-Men from what you can tell here and there. You might get one that kind of fades out. You don't realize they're not there, whatever. But the huge confrontation, Jean Grey um, kind of, you know, connects with the Goblin Queen. And actually the clone, I don't know if she's called, she calls herself Madeline Pryor yet. But there is a point. And uh, they help save um, the baby Nathan. And he escapes, but he has the techno-organic virus now. All right. So if you're going to keep things so similar and don't make logical sense, but you do things like this that's different, but kind of has the same logical conclusion, it just didn't happen in the comics the way it did. But okay, he's infected with the techno-organic virus, apparently to make him the most super-powerful mutant or something controllable. They didn't make mention of Apocalypse, and I think that was a, done on purpose to keep him out of it till, you know, till the show fucking ends, apparently. Um, 
and you know, Jean Grey's bringing her from the Goblin Queen from uh, memories, you know, and it's just um, gee, they got to give baby Nathan to Bishop so he can find a cure for Nathan in the future. Okay, again, you're doing something very similar to the comics, but you're not doing it exactly the same because in the comics. The Ascani, a future cult of, um, you know, peacekeepers in a sense. Uh, Mother Ascani is revealed to be the daughter from another universe, Rachel Gray. They take him to the future, <clears throat> and all right, it gets a little in up, but they clone him. Uh, the clone becomes an evil person called Strife with uh, immense powers. Cable uh, survives, but he has to learn to live with a techno organic virus. So, it's done a little differently here. You have to give to Bishop to bring to the future, not the Ascani. But again, in giving away spoilers or whatever, the Ascani show up later in the future of the show. And you're, you're, it's just introducing Apocalypse. And it just... Okay, anyway. So that's Fire Made Flash. You go to episode four. This was pretty cool. Jubilee just felt like I was settling into the original series show in 95. Jubilee wants to celebrate her birthday, but Magneto's being an asshole. So Roberto Sunspot um, uh, decided to play a new video game. Jubilee thinks it's a gift, because it was a little wordplay in the beginning. Motendo, and boom, they pulled into the fucking Mojoverse, and a Really fun episode, really tying in some cool graphics from like the original X Men game. And um, I think even the cartridge was the same as the X Men game. So, really cool Easter eggs. And even though this episode is split, because it's called Life Death Part One, um, you know, I guess it has two fucking names. Anyway, it's split to Forge um, and Storm. Where they're getting to know each other. He's trying to see if he can restore her powers. Um, uh, okay, so in the comics, there's a great villain for Forge called the Adversary. And they decide to reveal it. There was a little bit of a foreshadowing and a hint here and there. It was okay, but again, you're balancing that out with Jubilee and Roberto being caught together. It, it actually feels organic and getting to know each other. Uh, Roberto, from the beginning, doesn't use his power. He barely exhibits it or likes to show it. You find out things about the parents. And if I was keeping track, which I'm not, I was chatting things down. This is a lot of shit is going on. As I'm just, you know, breezing through it, there's lots of drama and development in the show. Again, though I enjoyed it, my brain kept going to every episode almost. Slow down, breathe, and it, it just felt weird. But great episode, one of my favorites. Uh, to see the nostalgia and Jubilee meeting her future self. The original Jubilee voice was the older version in the um, alternate reality uh, cyberverse thing, and the Forge thing with Adversary. I actually liked it. Um, then you get to episode five, and it's Remember It. I don't know why this is meant like this, but part six is Life Death Part Two. So I'm hoping this is, you know, me just following Wiki. Um, uh, you know, this is Madeline and Jean. Um, oh, so yeah, Jean's trying to figure out where her place is, because by now she's got more of her faculties, and she's like, you know, piecing together who she is. To get into this later, which is a really cool scene about her um, revealing that she has the memories of Nathan growing inside her, her, you know, seeing her for the first time. All those feelings from Madeline is given to her or shared with her in some way. Uh, she actually kisses Wolverine, which is whatever, and then Wolverine tells her to forget it, which I thought was a great thing that Wolverine secretly loves her, but he knows her and Cyclops, whatever. But don't, let's not go into the comic books with the bullshit with Emma Frost. Oh, fucking whatever. Anyway, Rogue and Gambit go to Genosha. Uh, Genosha's getting its own, because there's lots of things going on in the background, right? So 
Magneto saves the council by bringing up the atmosphere, but threatens him, really, in a sense. He Now they want him to be the leader of Genosha, which is going to be a mutant nation recognized by the UN. Okay. Um, then you get into a little bit of the rogue, um, having a relationship with Magneto. Uh, and it's all them trying to get Magneto to lead and convincing him. And it just... Again, it feels like a little bit of contrived stuff, but it had to be Magneto because he was the face of stopping the Mutant Liberation Front when they attacked the trial and him ripping the fucking place apart and floating everybody to the air. It just seems fucking silly. But, okay, so it's the X-Men. It's, just, it's a cartoon. I get it. But, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, okay, shit. Fifth episode, all of a sudden, you know, Cable's here. Wait, Cable is Madeline Pryor and Scott Summers' child. It's the baby from the future. And and he comes and he tries to warn them. Uh, he's coming, and it was done great because you didn't know if he was going to come and say, I'm here to stop Apocalypse or it was Sinister. He doesn't get to say anything, but he gets to meet Madeline and... He gets sent back to the future, and then it fucking kills, like, everybody. Spoiler, and um, in order to destroy the fucking thing, Gambit dies. And it's epic, in a sense. Because he's fucking Gambit. What the fuck is he going to do? Throw cards at it? But he doesn't know damage to get its notice, and it impales him with a fucking tentacle. And it's, like, holding him up in the air, and it's stuck in his side. And he charges it and uses all his power to charge Master Mold. And it was, it was an epic death in that sense. But I'm going, who the fuck is wrong with you? You are, you got the Gambit and Rogue thing. You're obviously fucking ruining that with her and Magneto because Magneto can touch her. And this is where I started going, like, okay, I get it. It's the X Men drama shit. But I didn't want to, I wasn't having it in the sense. Like, I, I just didn't really want to. See it and have to deal with the issues that were going to come up. And it, it it's just, okay, you know, Gambit's all right, we're just friends. Gam oh, so Magneto wants Rogue to be his queen wife. It just, like, again, it just didn't fucking feel right. I was like, is this some, like, mind uh, manipulating uh, event? Because you see Emma Forrest there a lot. So I was always thinking, like, hey, you know. Let's think outside the box. What's really going on here? But no. Rogue fucking chooses Magneto. It feels fucking ridiculous. Everybody gets fucking killed. Thousands of mutants. And if you're not going to do the real thing that happened in the comics, which was like Cassandra Nova, like, <laughs> which is a fucking insane story about, oh God, in the womb. Xavier had a twin, and he absorbed the twin, and then the twin comes out later. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, that was during a weird run, and I wasn't too fond of it. It was the black leather and shit. All right. So we're up to episode five. Thousands of mutants get killed. Um, assuming Magneto and everybody, and Gambit sacrifices himself. Boom. Done. Let me get to Life Dead Part 2. Um, and you're going into the Korean Chia Empire. It was pretty cool to see. I actually really enjoyed this episode. And, you know, Deathbird, the Shia uh, aliens, and you start figuring out where Xavier's been, how he's fitting in. Um, you know, uh, the Imperial God has their own, like, superhero force, and they kick ass, Gladiator. And Xavier's uh, given a choice, and it's drama with his wife, Lalandra. Oh, let's get married. Oh, and then it's it's kind of conf confronted by Deathbird, and they start plotting to fucking take the throne away from her, unless Xavier gives up his memories of Earth and his memories of X-Men, And which I found funny because when he says, yes, I'll give up my memories of Earth, then they ask him about the X-Men. And I'm like, aren't they Earth? Like, if he does that, doesn't he forget? Uh, anyway, he hesitates, and that hesitation brings fucking, you know, bullshit, and, and 
We're also split between the Forge and Storm. Um, uh, you know, episode or story where, you know, Storm getting in the machine. Like, she doesn't get her powers back, but she went into the machine. And Forge is confronted by an adversary. And um, he was hurt and infected somehow and him and storm have to go to a cave and get this special cactus and the adversary confronts them xavier sees um uh, the death of gambit and all the thousands of mutants dying he's got to go back to earth at, at any cost because that'll have a plot line probably season two because lasandra will be taken off the throne it was a bunch of drama stuff x-men to the core in a sense but Okay. Wow. It, it, okay, so Storm overcomes her fears in this episode. She gets her powers back, defeats the adversary, and then she puts the goop on <laughs> Forge, and he's fine. And they find out about the attack. Um, then you got the villains like Trask and Gyrick, who uh, throughout this thing, Gyrick was the one who assassinated it. Xavier, Trish is the one who built the Sentinels, and how is this all tied into each other? And Mr. Sinister. Okay, um, again, six episodes. I'm glossing over stuff, and it's all in there. Crammed up with X Men superhero lines. You know, it's, 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 it's a good insanity in a sense. Um, seven, episode seven, Bright Eyes. They have a funeral for Gambit. Rogue is going fucking nuts. She's fucking up installations. Uh, fucking up General Ross. And uh, Captain America shows up. Oh, she takes his shield and throws it. There's a couple of Easter eggs throughout this thing. In, in, intermittent between... It, obviously, your Sentinels are going to take over. It can't just be an X-Men story if it's the world. So they do throw some stuff in there. Spider-Man, Hulk. Iron Man, blah, blah, blah. But that's kind of in the, the last three episodes are such a three-parter. So, um, Trask is like, come to Mandrapur. Uh, they get Rogue on the way, but she's fucking just not written the way I wanted to be written. I get it. Gambit's dead. And it was actually a moment where uh, Magneto kissed her, and she's like, oh, Gambit's right. It's not just it's deeper than skin, meaning I think she realized Although she was temp she's tempting, she accepts Magneto's o offer because she wants to help mutant kind, that she's not gonna be in a sexual or intimate relationship with him. That was sort of what was gonna I think being implicated. But again, Mandrapur, Trask, um, Jubilee and Roberto going to the mother, revealing he's a mutant. Uh she's like keep it secret. Um Oh, so OZT has been hinted throughout the show. It's been on some uniforms and it's operations, Operation Zero Tolerance. And again, I knew that from just seeing it as a hint. But my brain's going, at exact, is that how it happened you know, in the comics? And the chain of events, but it doesn't really matter. And I'm not hopping on that in that sense. Uh, I understand even with time travel, you can just uh, make things up, alternate realities. So I'm fine with it. But again, it comes back to certain things are way too similar, and one thing in particular, which I'll get to. Fucking Trask is a sentinel, and they're doing the prime sentinels. Um, again, this doesn't feel right. And he, okay, so here's a problem you have with mutants that are portrayed really coolly and showing their weakness and flaws. So, you know, Cyclops has an optic blast. He can do, you know, they highlight him. But after a physical confrontation, if there's too many around him, he can be hit by things, blah, blah, blah. Although he's an excellent combatant. You make a prime sentinel, which is a human, techno-organic, super futuristic robot. And it makes it seem like one of them can kill all the X-Men at once. And then there's hundreds and thousands of them the next three parter and it just feels wildly out of control and kind of bullshit in that sense you're trying to figure out the secret of bastion 
who's the leader of this uh, Operation, Operation Zero Tolerance. Um, he murdered Guy Rick, and now that Trask is revealed to be a sentinel, because Rogue fucking kills him, basically, because she lets him go and he falls to his death. He just happens to turn into a prime sentinel, but that's okay now, because she's upset that Gambit died. Just portrayals of things, I could see where they're updating it, but if you're going to go, this is a year after the last show, trying to keep the lingo, you know, Jubilee a year older, like her birthday, and you're keeping that pace and you're immersing me right into the show, you might want to keep certain things, like, that wouldn't, to me, that wouldn't have been rogue in those circumstances, but, you know, I'm just, you know, just telling about my feelings as I'm watching it. Uh, Cable uh, uses an EMP, and he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, the best way to get rid of these things are EAMPs. I tried to warn you about this. So that was his warning before thousands were killed. But he keeps getting pulled away by the time stream. I found ridiculous uh, in that sense also. Uh, and Sinister is involved with Bastion. Um, I think it's revealed that Xavier is alive. Because they're like playing... I think there was a secret beaming of the uh, Shia wedding going to happen, revealing that the X-Men were like, oh, he left us, he's going to marry this queen, he's, he's not, he's neglecting Earth or abandoning Earth. A little bit of everything, like I said, but that's basically episode seven. Is it, again, if you can take Rogue out with one shot and Cyclops makes a point of saying things like that, and then you're starting to reveal hundreds and thousands, it feels ridiculous. But again, it's an X-Men cartoon, fine. Episode 8, 9, and 10 is Tolerance is Extinction. <laughs> Part 1, UN with Xavier, uh, anti-mutant protest, uh, the mutant massacre is an absolute point in time, can't be changed, which I found silly, uh, and that there's going to be a war, Bastion's going to enslave mutants in a utopia, it's just a lot, you know. You, I'm, again, I'm so I'm smiling because I see Gene, Cyclops, and Cable together. This sort of connection that they have, understanding the the father and so and so. Um, and then you find out, like in Pennsylvania, uh, Bastion is a human machine hybrid. And this, I guess, it's kind of like the comics, but it's not exactly how I remember it. But I'm just gonna say faulty memory and. It's close enough. Um, Nimrod technology, master mold programming in, in a, you know, organic ooze that infects the father, has sex with the mother, so the baby's born with it already in his DNA, controls machines. It's revealed that Xavier went to him. He would have been one of the first mutants, but the mother shut the door on him. So you're getting a lot of backstory, getting everything put into place. Dr. Valerie Cooper's in this a lot because she was a member of Operation Zero Tolerance. Again, doesn't feel like a good connection, but fine. Again, nothing in this show made me hate it or dislike it. One moment I went to the fast forward, and then just looking back on it, I'm like, I got through this for season, I'm like, okay, this was craziness. Maybe for a lot of people in a good way, so I'm not, you know, bashing that. Again, so like I said, you find out uh, the time traveling Sentinels Nimrod, and it's a uh, humans are becoming prime Sentinels, and with Sinister's help, and it, again, Sinister's connection doesn't feel right, and even his reveal about certain things, because things happen, and he's like, "Oh, I got plans." It just, again, didn't feel super right for me. Um. Um, okay, so in the horror of this, uh, all the shit's going on, Valerie Cooper releases Magneto, who creates a worldwide blackout with his Magneto powers, and dispatches all the Prime Sentinels. Alright, so, Xavier returns in part two, um, you know, it says here it's, he's met with some distrust, but that's the fucking Xavier... And again, I didn't like the some of the dialogue. And again, you could be drawn from the comics when it's revealed that Xavier, well, 
not revealed, but they made him a real dick. And a real, um, question his morals and stuff. And really dragged him through the mud for a long time. I'm not sure if they ever fixed it or the retcon that stuff, but okay, whatever. There's some distrust. They gotta stop bashing and convincing Magneto to reverse his blackout, because once it gets to a certain point, Earth is fucked. We can't reverse it again or something like that. So you got a couple of missions that are going to have to happen. Um, oh, and then they did a come with me split thing where Magneto's like, oh, they try to convince him. He's like, I ain't fucking helping you. And then he goes, who's with me? That type thing. And Rogue goes and Sunspot, which felt felt like bullshit again. It just, again, this is my interpretation of how I think the characters would feel, which is obviously the story they wanted to tell us, so I'm okay to go along with it, but I'm just honest about, as I'm watching this unfold, I'm like, oh god, bullshit, and, you know, that type of thing. And even DaCosta's answer was fucking, um, you know, my mom, they she had me arrested, it, it didn't feel right, and I'm gonna give some advice the, you know, because I know all the creators listen to my show. Stop. Where did I hear this before? But don't fucking equate mutants threat with taking away people's jobs. It's fucking stupid. So, for instance, oh, what happens if a uh, steel mill or whatever, you're going to mutant who can carry the weight of 100 men to bring people, people out of business or whatever. And... I've heard this before, I forgot where, and it just really stood out at me, like, this is such a stupid fucking excuse to use, and I think it bothered me in another instance more, but I can't really bring it to my forefront, because, you know, focusing on this show, but come on, I mean, I can understand they're loaded weapons, they're dangerous, fuck yeah, obviously they are, but when you're on a picket line, it's not like, you know, protesting, like, hey, they're going to take our jobs. You know, I you know, I guess you could, and again, I don't know. It, it just didn't feel right. I guess you know, it's still part of the X Men law, and the bigotry and the hatred, and coexistence, you know, allegories. They're still there and present, but some dialogue just doesn't make it feel, you know, connective with me. It feels forced, and you know, and again. So much is going on that I'm skipping. There's just so much going on. The X-Men are on Muir Island to, re- to regroup, to go into two teams. One team's got to confront Magneto. Another's got to take out Bastion. And uh, so Beast and Forge work together to create a collar, which I thought was cool. But it just doesn't really help in a sense. But It, it kind of does at the end. But you can feel the setups being applied but they don't they're not follow through exactly now here's what i find fucking stupid now it was stupid when it happened the first time in the comic books but i get it i actually get it so in the comic books when they go after asteroid m wolverine's on the team which is stupid why would you send wolverine after magneto as part of a team. Fine. Can you tell me, Wolverine, stay the fuck out of it. You get one chance. Come do your ninja shit. And go to kill him. Fine. I kind of get that. Still. Done in the comics bullshit. What happens in the comics? Magneto rips the metal. The Adamant team out of Wolverine. It starts his bone claw era. And it takes many years in the comics before he gets it back. In this cartoon, Wolverine is sent to Asteroid M. And I'm sorry if you want to do some of the same connective things, but as I've described, they've done things similar, but put a little twist on it. Changed it slightly, but not this. And I found it annoying. Like, yeah, I guess people want to see this in animated form. And it wasn't even done. It was like a panel from the comic superimposed. Like it felt weird. It didn't feel like it. You know, I gotta watch it again. But in my mind, it's just one panel 
type thing that they you hear a scream and the metal's coming out. Now in the comics it was a super shocking thing. It led to a revelation and about him healing up eventually, going in the danger room, and, and he's fighting the robots. And I think it describes him as like for the first time having a little bit of fear, you know, his healing factor, even though he healed, was not working well. But it was the revelation that Wolverine's bones were, were close with bone. Epic moment in the comic, and I'm guessing that's what they're going for. But why not do that differently? Why have one of the most obviously stupid things ever? Wolverine going after... They made fun of it in the movies. And it was the trick they pulled on him in the third one. And you just know what's going to happen. And by the way, if Wolverine gets you the way he got Magneto in this cartoon... You better kill fucking Magneto. I'm sorry. Three claws plunged through your back out your chest. However the fuck it was. However they described, made it look. And maybe I'm missing something. But it wasn't a scratch. It wasn't a slash. It only went like an inch or whatever. No, these were claws bursting through Magneto. And, okay, so you might have used the same thing. But he's... Right away, confronting Magneto, and it just felt wrong. He should have been, like, in the shadows, hiding in the rafters, whatever the fuck they are. And then, as everybody's fighting, he gets one chance. One chance, and that would have been it. But no, they decided to have him part of the team, jumping around and dodging metal things being thrown at him. And it just felt it felt wrong when it happened in the comics, but it was epic, and done in revelation this is one of those things i would have changed i would have fucking changed it and did a twist on it and subverted people's expectations but just simply having to be caught eventually and have uh apocalypse take the adamantium out mount give it to saber tooth or something like that and eventually in the comics wolverine had to beat saber tooth with the adamantium and then apocalypse gave it back to him I think that's how they converted it he became deaf Anyway, so you got part two, you know, Xavier getting together, two teams, one's going to fight Magneto, the other Bastion, and, you know, you got part three, you know, Wolverine's fucking out for the whole episode, Magneto and Xavier, or Xavier decides I'm going to have to take control of his mind and reverse the polar things, but this drags on a little bit, and obviously it's split between the X-Men fighting Bastion, uh, you know, from the other episode, and Bastion's now going to Asteroid M, and he's going to crash it, he takes Cable's arm and morphs into some huge, more advanced Sentinel, and these are the things that didn't feel right to me, because you're, you're, you're obviously taking a lot from the comic books, some literally, too literally, other things you're doing twist on, which felt kind of refreshing, that I'm not just watching certain things that I know are going to play out. And here, he, you know, Bastion's just a um, new being, sort of, and it didn't feel right. I love his Prime Sentinel outfit, the whole purple-black scheme with the, like, triangle. But, you know, now he's a winged beast, and there's huge fights going on back and forth. Um, and Xavier has no choice, and he reverses the waves using Magneto's power, and then while trapped in his mind, he tells everybody, oh, I'm going to um, try to save Magneto, and if he fails, he'll die inside with his mind. Uh, Cyclops is going to kill himself, you know, they got to blow up the fucking asteroid M, because now it's going to fall into Earth and create another Ice Age, like the fucking asteroid that Kill the dinosaurs. How that happens when something's orbiting Earth? Okay, it's going to create destruction. I get it. Anyway, they try their best to stop it. They work in unison. You see X-Men. The music throughout is awesome. And it's just a kind of shit show of just, like I said, this is episode 10, technically. Everything's coming together. Xavier, Jean's mind, uh, Magneto, and their mind. 
Um, oh, so Jean becomes the fucking Phoenix again and places that collar, the MacGuffin collar on Bastion, uh, cuts him off from the other Prime Sentinels. Still makes him an insane thing that never takes the thing off his head. That it was silly. Um, and he's kind of like blaming them, like you cut me off, whatever. No, the thing's still on your head. Explain to me why you can't take it off. And fucking Sinister's controlling Cable to fight the X-Men. And there's this psychic thing where he's like, oh, Cable gets to say goodbye to his son because they're going to kill themselves to help save humanity from the asteroid M. And Xavier helps um, Magneto. He awakens. He stops asteroid M. And then it just explodes. And all the X-Men that were there are presumed dead. Okay, so they're all dead, technically. Okay, somewhat. You find out in a couple of seconds that it's not maybe what it seems. But again, boom. Death. Uh, uh. Then a... um. Oh, so it's like six months later, Bishop tells Ford that the X-Men are trapped in time. And apparently they split them up. <laughs> and again, they're doing things from the comics. They're doing little twists on it, but not that Wolverine thing, which never made sense to begin with. It would have been a great opportunity to correct something and do something a little more slick, or at least do what I said. Have him not be there. They don't even think he's there, and then he has one opportunity. Anyway, so... Beast, uh, Xavier, Magneto, they're in ancient Egypt. They see people fighting, and I think they save or help in Sabrina, who becomes Magneto. So it's like 3000 BC. And, um, but Gene and fucking Cyclops, I mean, the year 3960, and they encounter the mother Ascani and the young Nathan and Rogue. Oh, no, not Rogue, Nightcrawler, and Beast, Xavier, or in Egypt. So it's just Gene and Cyclops. Now, in the comics, when Gene and Cyclops got married on their honeymoon, they were transported in time to raise Nathan in his much-needed years as an infant into young adulthood to help him learn how to control his power and keep the techno-organic virus in check. Here is that young Nathan, just about the time they would have left him because he had to get pulled back into the past. So there's a lot going on, it's taken from the comics, and, oh, and then, like, Apocalypse finds one of the Gambit's playing cards in Genosha. So, I'm, you know, I'm kind of all over the place in that way, even though I went through the episodes, because even in my mind, I, I had a smile from beginning to end, I'm watching the X-Men again. But this writing, these stories that are going put forth, the mass of things that they throw at you, like I could see people who don't know anything about the X-Men being somewhat lost and bombarded with so much visuals. I mean, it's the X-Men, so there's lasers and lightning and energy. It's just insane weapons, guns, mutants, robots. Little secret Easter eggs, you know, like uh, Omega Red. There were lots of things going on and people breaking out in prison, being saved. The, I think the Prime Sentinel virus has been saved or reversed in some way. I just think this is too much here. Maybe it's just uh, what if lately, uh, the... Show likes to live in certain moments. Now, maybe they're highlighted by the artwork they're doing, the way it's animated. But things feel heavy and weighted and have a certain look and feel to them. Now, this animated show, X-Men 97, is just a little bit of an updated version of the 95. And I loved it in that sense. But I still would have liked some breathing moments, like in the Storm episode and even the Jubilee episode. Sort of, you know, where it's split. So there are real highlights. I don't like the Genosha mass death thing. You got the Cyclops and Baby giving into the future. 
it, 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 it kind of reminds me of Batman vs Superman. It's like, wait, you're doing a Batman vs Superman movie, and you're gonna put Doomsday in there, put the death of Superman in there. Just so much is there. So there's a lot here. So much that is really so much fun. The, you know. I really enjoyed this all the way through. I needed just my thoughts as I'm, you know, getting ready to do the podcast. And it's like nagging at me, like, let this show grow a little bit more in certain aspects. But, again, I only watched some of the end of the uh, X-Men show. But the last season of the X-Men is a little bit disjointed. They changed the artwork. But you get the gist of it. And maybe it's more like you should have watched all five seasons and then you're right in, you're caught up and you're moving from the beginning when things are thrown at you. You're like, oh yeah. So I'm definitely going to say it's a me thing. Also the me thing with the Wolverine thing, it really bothers me the more I think about it. Like... I get it. You're going to do the co- comic book thing. I'll have bone claws for a while. I don't understand why you split certain things with the Ascani and you change some things in, in a somewhat drastic way. Refreshing, granted. You know, okay, so it's not exactly the comic book, but I'm going to get to see that thing. Like, I love seeing the Fallings Covenant on the original, like, seeing that come to life. This would be the catalyst for Onslaught. Because in the comics, after Magneto minds wiped by Xavier, a uh, little homongolus or whatever, evil part of Magneto, goes into Xavier. So after this, Xavier would be brooding about all the people he lost. And I think they're going to make it more horrifying. Because it really came off of the Age of Apocalypse in the comic books. And coming back from a world without Xavier, fixing the timeline... Xavier, blah, 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 Magneto, Fatal Attractions, there's so much that happened, but here it's just crammed and just feels like everything is bursting at the seams, which maybe is a great strategic way for people to get on board. Again, it could be just me, but is this just an observation as I'm watching it? Like, I wanted to breathe in certain areas and just let it wash over me, the X-Men are back. Just, you know, these are the people I remember, and that was a little bit changed. Again, I'm not going to say I liked where Rogue's arc went. Loved, I loved uh, Storm, uh, Jubilee, but, you know, I, I get the, the, the comics making a little bit of influence and Xavier, but you, you're connecting it to the show a year later, I thought it had been a little bit more in line with how the characters acted and stuff, but the voice acting is superb, the music that catches you up in the beginning just, you know, gives me tingles and makes me remember watching the show with my friends and watching it over and over. Some of those arcs were incredible. The Phoenix Saga and you know, again you had to pay homage to that here. But this is all in ten episodes. Each a thirty minute episode. Maybe the last episode was like forty minutes. But that's a lot. There's layers and layers and layers. And I thought it was a little too much. And this is only in the sense of me saying that I thoroughly enjoyed the show. But if I was giving it a critical rating, you know, I wouldn't get that perfect 10. Where maybe Batman the Animated Series, if you said. You know, one season we picked out. Because they had a thing where they came back and Robin was older. He became Nightwing. Again, I know it's not a team. But Bat- the Bat Family is fucking huge at this point. But I know it's a different aspect, like saying the Justice League, the first two seasons were more character driven. Uh, you know, they didn't have a lot of characters in it in that sense, where when it went to Justice League International, it was fucking every just, and I love that, by the way, having various people come in and out. So, 10 episodes, X Men 97. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Fun to see everybody back on the screen. The voices were on point. Again, a couple sounded really familiar. Some maybe a little different. Uh, again, I did read a little bit about certain things. 
I like the development of uh, certain aspects. Again, like I said, uh, Roro's arc, Jubilee. And I really didn't like the Magneto thing in the end because it wasn't a evil machinations. Like, I was really supposed to believe this, and I didn't. Um, even at the end, and make you know Xavier and Magneto in the mindscape, it just felt like something was a little wrong. But again, probably a me thing. I would totally recommend the X Men '97. If you don't know anything about it, maybe just watch the last season of the X Men or a couple of episodes that lead into this. But if you have the time and you. A super fan, I would even recommend, if you were going to do it anyway, watching all the X-Men shows again, episodes. I think it would really help. So, it's a craziness packed into 10 episodes. So much happening every episode. Some great story arcs, some I disagree with, but a total recommendation. I am glad the X-Men are back. I really loved the overall theme of it, you know. I did at least grasp that and understand that, you know, the Xavier's gone, you know, Cyclops is leader, but he's going to be a father. So some of the things work insanely well, really gel together. It's just, again, so much, a couple of things, too literal. Are you going to do other things? Are you going to do little different variations on it? In the end, totally recommend this. It's just uh, fun X-Men stuff. and really brings you back to the 95 show, something I totally love. So, I know right away, eventually, I will love this, although I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm going to have to watch it again. And that's one of the hallmarks, I think, of a really good show. Uh, borderline great. You know, things make you want to rewatch it again. And not just for feeling stupid that you miss things, you know. Because you'll see different things. Maybe I'll, I'll see variations and, you know, maybe where I'm distracted or the state of mind I'm in. In any case, I totally recommend this. I wish everybody the best. Hope you and yours are doing well. Take care, everybody.